Hello everyone, I'm Sam Arano, and this is the triumphant return of Jewish history on the road. And we're going to pick up right where we left off with a tour of the Galilee in the early first century in the time of the Tetrarchy, and specifically the time of Jesus. Uh, I'm starting here in Nazareth to, well for obvious reasons, but also to make a point, which is Nazareth today is the biggest city in the Galilee by far. The provincial capital is right next door in the suburb of Nova Galil, but uh, that's a fairly recent development. Back in the day, this was a teeny tiny hamlet of just a few hundred people, even for centuries after the Roman period. And I feel like that's important to understanding the economic and political context in which early Christianity was able to become a thing. First things first, uh, the Galilee was not part of the first temple period kingdom of Judah. This was part of the northern kingdom of Israel. It was inhabited by Arameans and uh, Israelites, and it was pretty well depopulated during the Assyrian and Babylonian conquest. So when Cyrus the Great uh, conquered Babylon and allowed the Jews to return, some of them settled in here, in the Galilee and they founded new towns. Some of them they named after towns in the south, like you had Jaffa in Galilee, that's Yafia. You had, uh, you know, Beersheba in Galilee, that's Beersabe now. You had even Bethlehem in Galilee, which is not far from here. More importantly, the Galilee was eventually conquered by the second temple kingdom of Judea, the Hasmoneans, under Organos I, and that's when things really got going up here. This became a major intellectual center. However, it was very much not an economic center. Lots of great, very important, influential thinkers and rabbis and uh, military figures came from the Galilee, but they weren't really based there, at least not until after the Bar Kokhba revolt when, you know, the temple was long gone, people started moving here, and that became the center of, you know, uh, Yoda Hanasi. I'm ranting. Let's cut this out. In my video, The Constitution of Judea, I really made this aggressive uh, claim that the Great Sanhedrin was a very forward-thinking, very modern form of government, and it was. It was probably based on the Roman Senate. And although, in my opinion, it would be correct to say that this was a constitutional form of government, it would be wrong to say it was a representative form of government. Uh, the towns that elected members of the Great Sanhedrin they were not elected by the public, first of all, they were elected by the local Sanhedrin, but also they were all in the south. This was new territory. It was not included in that system of government. And even if it had been, the idea of local representatives in your government as people who will bring economic stimulus to your constituency, that's a fairly recent idea. So what little public investment there was in the Hasmonean and later Herodian periods was entirely military. You can see this in the provincial capital of the time, Sepphoris, but you can also see it here, uh, the kibbutz of Mishpah Ha'emek, which is one of several, but probably the most likely site of the ancient cavalry town of Geva, or Geva Parashi. They call it Geva of the horsemen of Geva Hippelon. Hippelon is it's in Greek, uh, right. cavalry. The city is not a rich city. Most of the artifacts are here are very common. Uh, the importance of uh, this site has to really rest on the understanding of that we are the main thoroughway from Haifa, the area of Haifa, going through the Jezreel Valley, Janine and beyond. So anyone who controlled that could literally cut the north from the, the south. And then of course we have the main junction which gives you the road from uh, Caesarea, the area of Caesarea, or the Mediterranean coastline, Via Maris, all the way to Damascus. So just think that you sit where these two major highways cross one over the other. You control that, you control everything. So that's about it. Uh, during the Herodian period, most of the investment here was military, whether it was special units like the Parashim or uh, local, provincial, or Topark governors, um, and even then this was an area that was not very wealthy. Even people who you would think of as being very uh, prestigious or highly educated were generally very poor. 
In fact, by the early first century, the Galilee had reached a point where it was overpopulation to the point where even if you had all of your kids working the fields, there wasn't enough food for them that they were collecting, and they had to go elsewhere. Many of them went to Jerusalem, many of them went out to other parts of the Jewish diaspora. But when Herod died, and Judea was separated into four separate states, all of a sudden, his son Antipas, who ended up being in charge of the Galilee and Korea, which was smaller but wealthier, suddenly needed a way to make the Galilee pay for itself. And he actually came up with a pretty good idea, which was to move the center of the Galilean economy away from agriculture altogether and into fishing. Now, Tiberias was not a new place. It was not a place where people had not been living. There were hot springs a few uh, meters down from here, and they're still in use. And that may have been one of the ideas that led to the city being built here. But it wasn't a very nice place for a lot of people to live. We may be much higher up here than the Dead Sea, but we are still below sea level. In the summer, it is very hot and very swampy, and this was very much a time when malaria was a problem, and it wasn't very defensible either. And this was very much a time when all of those elements were not conducive to a large population. But Antipas saw that the Sea of Galilee had huge stocks of fish, of tilapia, of musht. I don't know the English word for what that is. Maybe you could tell me and then I can feel like an idiot. This area is pretty densely populated now, but honestly, it probably would have been just as densely populated back then. This was a huge movement of people down to this coastline. In fact, the lake was shared by three different countries. This side, the west side, was the Tetrarchy of Galilee, but on the other side was Batania, which was run by Antipas's brother Philip, and they effectively ran it as one country together until Philip's death. And on a little section here, to the southeast, was the city-state of what in Greek was called Hippos, and in Aramaic was called Susita, but they both mean horse. Uh, that was part of the Decapolis, the cities that Pompey had created a confederation out of. They were pagan. There was a big rivalry. So in that early period of the Tetrarchy, the tens, the twenties of the first century, this just would have been teeming with new activity, construction everywhere, new towns just popping up all over the lake. And these were people who were coming together who would never have been in contact with each other, most likely. These were people who would come off the farms. Now they were coming into contact with power and education. And that's one of the ways this became like a real center of radicalism and new thought. In fact, it is hypothesized that Jesus when he came down from Nazareth, was someone who was not able to make it on the farm, uh, as well as his brother, one brother? I don't remember, I think it was just one. And they'd probably come down to get jobs building this new city, Tiberias. In fact, uh, people say he was a carpenter, but the original Greek word, tekton, could mean any kind of builder. And it was actually probably most likely a stonemason, since that was the thing that was needed most. I think it's easy to say that in the short term, Antipas's goals for the Galilee failed because there was war, there was unrest, the rise of Christianity, of course, and the, uh, and of course the Jewish Roman Wars, in which the city was destroyed in the first one, got away pretty okay in the ones after. But then, of course, in the long term, because Jerusalem was destroyed and the south was completely depopulated and denuded by desertification and Roman agricultural practices, this became the new center of the Jewish world. Once the dust had settled after the uh, Bar Kokhba revolt, this became the new capital of Judaism. This became the new home of the great Sanhedrin. This was where the Hebrew calendar was formalized and automated. And in 
that time, the Galilee became much wealthier than it had been during the Herodian period. Because this is where the power was, in as much as it still existed. And of course, this remained one of the centers of the Jewish world, of Jewish thought, for a period right up to the Crusades. The Jerusalem Gemara, even though it's named after Jerusalem, was written and published here. There are a lot of people out there who like to tell me in social media that Christianity is the older form of Judaism. It's the original form of Judaism, and that Judaism was created after Jesus to spitefully hide his divinity. And there are also people who believe, and they tell me this too, that Jesus could never have existed because we don't have his birth certificate. Both of these viewpoints embrace a very Christianity-centric worldview. They don't really think about the Jewish context, but as far as I can tell, when you get past things that were created, ideas that were brought up long after Jesus' time, there's very little that is not Jewish about this story. It's in the geopolitics, it's in the geography. Moses Mendelssohn said it. Jesus was perfectly in following with Judaism, with the House of Hillel. He was a Pharisee. He just was a Hillelist and not a Shemaist. I could show you more. I could show you Magdala or Ginosa or Kvarnachum, but honestly, I'm pretty tired. Uh, I was going to do this video before there was a pandemic, but I have a lot more work to do. But hey, I felt that I had to do it. You know, Easter is coming when I'm filming this and Passover and and I love the North. It's always an adventure up here. Also, I promised myself I wouldn't cut my hair until I made this video. And I was running out of time. So. Chag Pesach Sameach. Happy Easter. Maybe I'll do another one of these. Who knows? Special thanks to my patrons, including Mir Akbar Ali, Jeremy Biskind, Boris Cherney, FC, Jay Fleischman, Osher Gordon, Bob Huddy, Raphael Kellerman, Eric Lederman, and Serhi Harasimov.